is Jordan uh, Marocha, who is an astrophysicist uh, at CU. So, uh, and, and I'm sorry, Jordan's talk is uh, Constraining the Universe's First Stars and Supermassive Black Holes with 21 Centimeter Observations from the Lunar Far Side. So, Jordan, go ahead. All right, thank you. Well, I'm looking forward to piggybacking on all the talks we've heard already. We've heard about the sort of uh, science case for the 21 centimeter signal from uh, Steve and, and Jack. We've heard about instrumental design and issues at the foregrounds. Um, and today I'm going to focus on the final stage of any 21 centimeter pipeline, which is, uh, of course, interpreting the measurement. What does it mean? Um, so, though we've heard about the big picture uh, already, I still want to uh, start my talk with uh, a little bit of the science case for measuring the signal. Um, and then I'll jump right into uh, model independent constraints on the signal. There, have, there are some worries that, you know, given an observation of the signal, could we really uniquely constrain the properties of the first stars and black holes, or could we have wildly different models that give rise uh, to the same observed signal? So I really want to spend most of my talk focusing on, uh, on this, uh, this point, and hopefully at the end I'll have some time to allude to some work uh, just on the horizon. So the big picture, of course, is that the first billion years of the universe are really a frontier observationally right now. We have a detailed map of the universe uh, when it was only about 400,000 years old. That's the cosmic microwave background. Uh, and we're starting to, to know what it looks like uh, about a billion years after that. Um, in the upper right panel here, I'm showing you uh, images from the Hubble Space Telescope that's starting to glimp, glimpse high redshift galaxies uh, when the universe was uh, uh, only a billion years old or less, uh, that's this panel here. Uh, and in the bottom panel uh, of this slide, where it may not look like much, but this is actually a quasar at redshift seven. So again, we, we know that supermassive black holes must exist uh, when the universe was less than a billion years old. And so as Jack mentioned, these, these questions were highlighted by the decadal survey. When did the first stars, galaxies, and black holes form? More interesting, what, interestingly, what were their properties? Uh, and then reionization, uh, when was it complete and what objects drove it? Now, while the Hubble Space Telescope is starting to directly detect galaxies uh, well into the epoch of reionization, the prospects for directly detecting the first stars and black holes, which likely form at much higher redshifts, uh, redshifts 20, 30, and beyond potentially, uh, the prospects for detecting those directly are, are, are very bleak. And so that's one of the motivations of the 21 centimeter signal. While the, while the first stars themselves are, are too small to detect directly, their impact on the intergalactic medium uh, is potentially huge. And, and that's what I'm showing you in this cartoon picture here uh, from a Scientific American article by Avi Loeb. On the far left, we see the cosmic microwave background radiation. And then as the first stars uh, light up, they produce these uh, ionized bubbles of gas around them. And in fact, the first sources of x-rays heat up this intervening material between ionized bubbles, uh, giving rise to the 21 centimeter signal. So that's really one of the motivations uh, of looking at the 21 centimeter transition is to, um, not instead of looking for the first sources of light directly, uh, look at their environment um, and try to infer their properties indirectly. Um, and so the, how we go about doing that uh, is what I'm gonna focus on uh, for the rest of the talk. Now, uh, this is a, a cartoon picture uh, of the global signal, which we've seen uh, several times already, again, parameterized by its turning points, uh, here labeled A through D. And I want to draw your attention to the functional uh, dependences of this observable quantity. On the x-axis, we have uh, redshift, or time. And on the y-axis is the brightness temperature uh, relative to the cosmic microwave background. And, and what I've shown here is that, in general, the signal depends on things like uh, the volume filling factor of H2 regions, uh, the electron fraction of uh, the intergalactic uh, medium gas between H2 regions, its temperature, uh, that's Tk, uh, this parameter J alpha, which parameterizes the background uh, radiation intensity at the Lyman alpha uh, frequency. Uh, but as you might have guessed, if, if we were really parameterizing the signal in terms of its inflection points, if we want to predict where these inflection points will happen, uh, we need to know about the time derivatives of all of these quantities as well. Uh, and so we have a set of eight quantities uh, that, in general, give rise to this, this signal with uh, four main features uh, in, in this slide. Um, and now, as, we, as we've heard throughout the session, these features are coincident with a lot of uh, really inconvenient uh, features in the radio part of the spectrum, 
uh, such as the FM radio band, uh, communications, television broadcasts, and so on, uh, which make uh, the lunar far side a really appealing destination. And so I'm not going to spend too much time talking about this since we've already heard about it a lot, but our, our focus here at CU has been on this DARE mission concept, uh, which would put an orbiter uh, around the moon and observe uh, when in the shadow, uh, the radio shadow of the Earth. Okay, so 21 centimeter modeling, uh, the traditional approach has been to do uh, what I'm calling forward modeling, which is we have simple theoretical arguments for how the first star should form. Steve talked about this a bit. Um, molecular hydrogen is really the only coolant available in the universe at these times, which uh, uh, predict, and because of that, we, we expect the first generation of stars should be very massive. Okay, so you take an idea like this, um, you have an idea of how massive the first stars might be, what are their emission properties, that is, how many ionizing photons do they emit, uh, and you, you couple those ideas to an, uh, a chemistry solver uh, that tells you what the temperature and ionization state of the intergalactic medium should be, given some properties of the luminous sources. So that's been the traditional approach. You put in a set of astrophysical parameters, and out comes a model for the 21 centimeter signal, a prediction. So we're actually going to take the opposite approach. We're going to, we're going to investigate the properties of an arbitrary re realization of the signal and ask what set of physical properties of the universe would be consistent with an observation of that arbitrary signal. And so uh, this, is, this is really uh, looking at things differently. It allows us to consider, uh, under different sets of assumptions, how reliably we can extract um, properties of the universe given these inflection points in the 21 centimeter signal. So for the, re the remainder of my talk, uh, I'm going to step through uh, the first two features of the signal, what we've been calling turning points B and C, which uh, should mark the epic of the first stars and first black holes. And the upper left corner uh, will remind you where we are in the signal. So if you remember from a few slides ago, I said that the signal and its inflection points in general depend on a set of eight quantities, which is uh, really daunting given that we may only be able to measure the redshift and the brightness temperature of any of these features. But prior to the first uh, generation of stars, we think we know what's going on in the universe. Uh, this is the, the post-recombination epoch. The universe is uh, effectively neutral, neutral to a part in uh, 10,000 or so. And it's cooling adiabatically as the universe expands. And so in fact, under this set of assumptions, it turns out that the, really the only unknown is the strength of this Lyman alpha background intensity. And so what you're seeing in this plot is that as a function of the position of, of turning point B in redshift on the x-axis and brightness temperature on the y-axis, we can actually constrain the strength of the Lyman alpha background. That's the, the color bar in this figure. Okay, so from turning point B, under these assumptions, we should be able to simply read off the Lyman alpha background intensity. Now, uh, again, the position of the inflection points is a, a tracer of the rate of change in these quantities, so we also get a measure of the rate of change in the background intensity, which should tell us something about the star formation rate density at the corresponding redshift. Okay, so stepping forward in time a little bit, I want to focus mostly on this X-ray heating epoch. It has the potential to be the strongest part of the signal. Okay, in our fiducial models, it's about uh, at about uh, minus 100 millikelvin, um, and making it uh, potentially the easiest part of the signal to extract from the foreground. I, I hesitate to use the word easy, um, but but seeing the signal and absorption at all is uh, really important because it tells us that the kinetic temperature of the universe is less than the cosmic microwave background temperature. So just having a handle, an upper limit on the temperature of the universe gives us an upper limit on the amount of energy that could have been injected into the universe prior to that time. And so if you imagine sort of an instantaneous burst of heating in the early universe, there's some threshold beyond which the universe would have instantaneously been heated to temperatures above the cosmic microwave background. And so as a function of the position of turning point C in this plot, we can come up with a range of acceptable values for the heating rate density of the universe. In the blue region, uh, these heating rate densities correspond to a universe that's still cooling. Okay, so if we see turning point C at all, uh, the heating rate density has to be larger than those values. And in the red region, uh, those heating rates would have instantaneously heated the universe to temperatures higher than the microwave background. 
Uh, so if we see an absorption signal at all, we can rule those out. Now the really cool thing is if we're able to accurately uh, pinpoint the brightness temperature uh, of turning point C, we can come up with a revised upper limit on the heating rate density. And so that's what you're seeing here with these triangles is uh, if the signal were at, uh, measured at minus 250 millikelvin and a redshift of 15, we'd have, a, we'd have a very good idea of what the heating rate density of the universe is at that moment. And then each of these uh, sets of triangles correspond to 50 millikelvin increments. So our, our fiducial models put turning point C almost right in the middle of this plot uh, between redshift of 20 and 25 uh, for reference. Now, without making any assumptions about the, the functional form of uh, how the heating rate density of the universe evolves with time, the turning, turning, position of turning point C uh, gives us a limit, like I said, on the cumulative energy deposition uh, that's occurred in the universe prior to the redshift of this feature. And so that's what we're seeing in this plot. On the x-axis, again, the redshift of turning point C. On the y-axis, it's brightness temperature. And the color bar tells us, uh, given a measurement of turning point C uh, at any of these positions, uh, what the cumulative energy deposition uh, had been. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the next plot. And I just want to allude to where we're going next. I've, I've told you that turning points B and C constrain the strength of the Lyman alpha background and the heating rate density of the universe, uh, uh, respectively. Now, the really interesting thing isn't the heating rate density of the universe or the strength of the Lyman alpha background. What we really want to know uh, is the em emissivity of the universe uh, at the corresponding wavelength. So in the lyman Werner band and the X-ray band. Steve alluded to this in his talk, that the, the 21 centimeter signal is really a probe of the radiation background at various frequencies. So our next steps are to take uh, what we consider these unique constraints from the 21 centimeter signal on the Lyman alpha background and the heating rate and convert them into emissivities um, at Lyman alpha and the X-ray. And this is really difficult because Lyman alpha photons and X-rays free stream through the universe uh, potentially for a very long time before they absor they're absorbed. So they could be emitted, or they could be absorbed at redshifts much lower uh, than their emission redshifts. And so that's the focus of work I'm doing now, is how to map these physical quantities into the actual properties of the first sources. So my conclusion is just really quickly is that there are model independent constraints to be had from the global signal. Uh, namely properties uh, of the heating evolution of the universe and the Lyman alpha background strength just for these first two features that I focused on. Um, and so this is really important because it tells us that the signal will tell us more than just gross, estimate, gross estimates of when the first stars and black holes form. In principle, we can learn something about their properties as well. So uh, stay tuned for a paper that should be submitted soon uh, with the details of this, of this work. So thank you. Great, thanks very much, uh, Jordan. I appreciate that excellent uh, talk. And uh, when that paper comes out, uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, sending that in our direction, I'd love to read it. Um, and and I just had we we again have a, a shy online group, um, so uh, I will ask one question um, that I know you didn't have time to go over. The on back on slide 12, the disallowed region. What's the explanation for for that? Oops, I probably probably just wasn't listening close enough. Yeah, um, on the X-ray heating, um, right? So, yeah. so this disallowed region, uh, this is disallowed because uh, while people are very good at coming up with exotic heating mechanisms in the universe, it's very hard to think up exotic cooling mechanisms that would allow the universe to cool oh. faster than adiabatic cooling. So this okay. region corresponds to observing the turning point where. Uh, the universe is colder than we think it could possibly be at that redshift. So, okay, got it, got it. That makes sense. Okay, thank you, thank you. All right. Well, thanks again. Really uh, enjoyed your talk and and really looking forward.